Hello everyone and welcome to this, the 22nd in our ongoing series of lectures on Middle Egyptian and hieroglyphics. And today we'll be covering the relative form of the verb. So the good news about the relative is that this is the last major verbal form. Uh, there are a few like minor things still to cover that we haven't gotten to yet uh, that are kind of back in chapters 11 and 12 of Hoke. There are additionally some points on uh, verbal negations and a few other things that we still need to go over. But for the most part, this is the last like complicated, important verbal form to know. Bad news is this at the end because it is probably one of the toughest to truly appreciate and understand up there with the second tense. Uh, and it is in particular very difficult to recognize. It does not exactly stick out until you train yourself in how to look for it. So this is like the video on the perspective, like the video on the second tense. If you have to watch it again, you should do that. This is the kind of thing that I would not be surprised if you felt the need to like repeat to make sure you got it fully, um, or even just to really spend a lot of time doing the exercises in lesson 13, which focuses on the relative. So what does relative mean? Uh, relative is uh, it's a grammar term that gets used in the analysis of a lot of different languages. Uh, and in English, when we say a relative, we usually mean relative pronouns. Uh, these are who and whom, if you're using like really proper English, what in certain very unproper forms of English, uh, which or that. So the woman whom I saw or the house that I bought, uh, just for a couple of examples, um, in general, the, these relative pronouns are creating a, a whole separate clause that altogether kind of acts like an adjective that modifies a particular noun. Uh, so in the woman whom I saw, you know, woman is of course a noun, uh, and then whom marks out the beginning of a new clause. And like any clause, it has a subject, I, and a predicate, saw, um, and then it all links back and modifies the original woman to provide clarifying information about it. Egyptian does have a relative pronoun. Uh, really, it has a whole set of relative pronouns that are conjugated for gender and number. Uh, which is neti, and then like netat, and netut, etc. We have already covered this in a previous video. Uh, however, in addition to that, it has a verb form specific to relative clauses in particular uh, that when used just like creates a relative clause like this just by existing. And we'll get into the differences between these two uh, in a moment. And first we need to figure out like how to recognize the relative verb. I always like to start with that. Um, the simultaneous good and bad news about recognizing the relative verb is you already know how to do it. Um, because it is, well at least you, you already know how to do it if you've been watching these videos in chronological order. Because relative verbs look exactly like participles. Um, exactly, exactly like participles. Uh, down to the conjugating to agree with their subject uh, or with their antecedent, I guess you could call it, uh, down to the having a perfect, imperfect, and perspective, or really like a past, present, and future form. And that future, as is frequently true in, in Egyptian, kind of has a, well, perspective is the term that they use, but a hypothetical aspect. It's not necessarily what will happen so much as what should happen. Uh, much like, as you would expect, the prospective participle. So if you need a refresher on how this conjugation works, see lecture 18. It works, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, however, there's a little bit of additional nuance because the relative verb has a further form that is not expressed in the participle. Uh, it, this is the sejmu n f. Uh, the w is usually not written out, which means it will look identical to a sejmu n f, and it is conjugated like a sejmu n f. So 
no, for example, uh, no gemination, um, and sometimes the dropping of third weeks that happens in sedum and F forms, it's going to look exactly like that. It will not be super confusing to see. Uh, passives take the passive infix two, which is also something that's common to a number of other forms. This is kind of unlike the passive participles, which are not always really super well marked out, unfortunately. And when they are marked, are marked in ways that are remarkably similar to the active participles. Um, so at least we have that going for us, that the relative verb can be marked out for passive very clearly. Uh, an, a couple of telltale signs exist um, that are that are helpful and that are just kind of markers for the form and that I put in here as I was making this because I felt like they, they went with this identifying thing. First of all, um, you will see a verb and you will see a subject and you will not see a direct object. Um, there are, of course, a whole class of verbs, transitive verbs, most verbs that require some kind of direct object. You know, one can say, like, I picked up the chair, but you, you can't really just say, like, I picked up. Like, you, you could technically, but it wouldn't really be a meaningful sentence because you, you have to do the action to some other object. Uh, and if you see something like that, in an Egyptian text, that is a telltale sign that, not certainly, but very probably, you are dealing with a relative, especially if any of the other signs that we're going to discuss also show up. Um, this is because the direct object of that verb, as expressed in English, would be this relative pronoun, the thing that I picked up, where that is the direct object. So like if you said the chair that I picked up, then turned into a single sentence rather than this set of clauses, it becomes, I picked up the chair. Now you have a direct object, now you're perfectly fine. In Egyptian, you don't need that relative pronoun, it's just the quirk of grammar. This verb form is effectively a combination verb and relative pronoun. It would have been expressed differently in speaking. We do not have spoken Egyptian, of course, anymore, so we do not know how that would have sounded. Uh, but for the Egyptians, it was sufficient just to use this particular form of the verb, and that implies the relative pronoun. Um, also something that I think is useful when looking at a relative verb is that they are made, if, if you have like a question or something else where what the relative form is actually referring to isn't really clear, it will take a T ending. Uh, this is actually something that's not in Hoke. Fun fact, or at least I couldn't find it in Hoke. This is something that my professor pointed out to me in class and that I thought would be very helpful uh, just as sort of a, a thing to know about the relative verb is that sometimes it will just take a T ending uh, in a question and that will kind of tip you off that maybe you are dealing with a relative verb. We're actually going to see one of those in one of the examples uh, that I'm going to put up. So relatives, of course, look a lot like participles. Uh, the big tell, the one that you need to kind of burn into your mind forever, is that relative verbs do take a subject. Participles do not. Participles never take a subject. Um, remember that the basic idea of a participle is something like hearer. Um, it's either the noun or the adjective that you would use to describe someone or something that does some activity. Whereas the relative is describing in sort of a roundabout way a past, present, or future action uh, that was done to something. Uh, and you're, you're specifying what exact person or object you're talking about by this relative clause that specifies, you know, out of this crowd of people, it's the one to whom whatever thing happened. Um, grammatically speaking, remember a clause is a subject and a predicate. A participle is, does not have those. It's 
if you parsed it as a verb, it would just be a predicate, but it's not really a verb grammatically. Grammatically, it's either a noun or an adjective. So it's just a subject or a part of a subject, um, or I suppose part of a predicate, but it can't, it doesn't have like a full subject and a full predicate. A relative is fully a verb, so it's a predicate, and it has a subject always, which means it's always the full clause. It can always act as a grammatical unit. And what about that netty thing that I brought up earlier? What is the difference in usage between them? And the, the answer is that netty is what you use when there isn't a verb. Uh, remember that Egyptian has, it has a verb to be, but that verb to be has like a pretty limited use. Uh, they do not just use it to like link an object to a quality of that object as we do very frequently in English. You know, you wouldn't say like the sky is blue in Egyptian using a verb uh, as you know from much, much earlier, you would just say blue the sky. Uh, and that would link those two together in the same way that the English word is links the two concepts together. Um, Waj pet, for those who are wondering, for uh, how to say the sky is blue in Egyptian. Although, uh, interesting note in Egyptian colors, that could also mean the sky is green. They didn't differentiate between blue and green. Uh, relative verbs are what you use when you're doing, when you need something other than the word is or are to be in there. Uh, so it's not, you know, the man who is over there. It is, I did what his majesty commanded. Um, you know, presumably some, some further specification. Uh, but effectively, you know, the, remove the relative pronoun, turn it to a noun, and put it after the verb, and you get a whole sentence with a verb. Um, and that's kind of, the, I, I guess, the synthesis of this in the previous slide is a relative is going to show up, and you can always translate it as a relative pronoun plus some noun subject plus a predicate, meaning a verb. Maybe it'll have an indirect object that's marked um, or a direct object that's marked, usually not, but occasionally, and then some kind of like adverbs that are modifying that verb. Uh, and again, netty will be translated as to be as appropriately, you know, is, was, are, were, etc. So now we can kind of jump into our examples because there isn't a ton more to go on about, but we, we just, I think, need to see how the relative works. Uh, so this is our example of a perfect. Uh, now the perfect relative doesn't get used a ton in Middle Egyptian because it gets replaced by the Sejimu NF relative, but it does show up and it's important to keep in mind as an option when you are thinking about how to translate something. So this example is Peter Jedet Ne Neb E. And yes, that last word is Neb E. There are two seated man determinatives because the first one is Neb Lord is written the basket plus a seated man to indicate that it's the person meaning. And then my Lord requires another person to say, yes, this is, you know, it's not just a Lord, but my Lord, the first person singular suffix. Um, other than that, grammatically, it's not horribly complicated. Uh, Peter means what, so it is a question. Um, and then we have a verb that's just kind of sitting there uh, with a subject, nebi, and a direct object, ne. Uh, but the, then there really isn't anything else after that. And this is an example of what I was talking about with the lack of direct object kind of tipping you off that this might be a relative. Because if you just took jedet ne nebi, what you would get is, my Lord says to me, but if you look at the further example in the text, because this does go on a little longer, but I didn't put it in, you don't get like a direct quotation, which is what you would expect for, you know, my Lord says to me, go to, go to Nubia and conduct a trading expedition, but you don't get something like that. 
uh, you get n no further, nothing for the Lord to say, but you do have a noun or really a pronoun right in front of it. Uh, Peter, what? And English is a little weird doing, uh, doing relatives with questions, but that's basically what this turns into. If you interpret it as a relative verb, you can say something like, what is it that my Lord said to me? Um, is probably a super literal way to take the Egyptian. Um, we wouldn't translate it that way because that's like, it's kind of awkward speech. We would just say, what did my Lord say to me? But the underlying grammar is, you have, the basic question is, Peter, what is it? And then being modified by a relative clause that my Lord said to me. And then we have a present uh, or an imperfect form of the relative. Uh, this is again an abbreviated example because the example in Hoke goes on like quite long to create the full sentence uh, and it includes like quotation stuff and we don't, we don't need to deal with that. We can just deal with kind of the key part with the relative. So we have ir het nebet dedet ser neb neges neb er hut necher. Uh, ir is a particle. It can mean if, but it can also mean as for. Uh, these concepts are not as distant as we might immediately think. They're, it's the same particle in either case, and it's really just contextual. Uh, in this case, though, we can say pretty confidently that it's as for based on the rest of the context. Uh, het nebet is a pretty common phrase. It means anything because uh, het is a thing and the nebet is like all. So just all things or anything. Uh, and then we have a verb, dedet, and it's been written really weirdly. Uh, you will recognize this triangle because this is the redi triangle. It is the bread loaf. Uh, if the bread loaf has been written with two of the triangles, it is not a, well, it's not one of like the quote easy forms of the verb. Something is going on. Um, if memory serves, I think only relatives and participles are written this way. There might be one or two other forms, but the double loaf is, uh, for dead is not a very common way to write this. Um, in particular, you'll note that it's dead at because it is agreeing in gender with het, which is another thing to tip you off is a verb is agreeing in gender with a noun that immediately precedes it, which really makes you think that maybe something is going on where this verb is actually an adjective. Uh, and then the rest of this is, is basically vocabulary. Sarah Neb, any official, Neges Neb, any commoner, Er Hut Necher, to the temple. And of course we know that Redi means in, at its core to give. So we have as for anything, and then some form of to give, uh, and then any official or any commoner to the temple. Okay, well, what do we do with that? Well, we can, our best option here is, of course, a relative. And here is why. First of all, we have a verb that is agreeing in gender with a noun that immediately precedes it. That means it's probably an adjectival form. And an adjectival, the adjectival forms of the verb that we have learned, and I think you know, basically the full list of them, are participles and relatives. And now we need to narrow it down between those two. And what we get immediately after the verb is a noun, two nouns, in fact. Um, but if just one of them were there, it would be the same. And indeed, that noun could very logically be construed as the subject of our verb. First of all, it's not marked off by anything that would tell us that it's like part of a prepositional phrase or an indirect object or something like that. And second of all, logically, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, our verb is to give, and we have an official or a peasant, uh, and we know that it is being given er hut necher to the temple, and a, an official or a commoner giving something to a temple feels like a very reasonable thing to happen. Uh, that makes total logical sense, so it passes that test. And so we can pretty confidently say that it is a relative, and indeed, if we put it as a relative, we get a very solid interpretation. Ir 
as for chet nebet anything, and then if we're saying it's a relative, now we kind of need a, a relative pronoun, so we'll say which or that. Uh, at any official or any commoner, dedet gives er hu necher to a temple. And yeah, that's a that's a logical. It's not quite a sentence yet. We need more context to kind of fill it out, but that's the the, the first part of a sentence. We have arrived at a a logical statement that would make sense given the further context, which ends up being about uh, how it is not permissible to give something to a temple and then ask for it back. No, no takesies, backsies once you've done donations. And then we have uh, the prospective relative. This sentence, if you have been doing all of your exercises and readings, you will already be familiar with because it shows up in the Shipwreck Sailor, uh, which I, I actually kind of appreciate that he used this. Uh, I personally am a really big fan of Shipwreck Sailor as a teaching text. Uh, speaking of someone who has learned quite a bit from doing it and also just thinks the story is kind of fun and interesting and a, a cool little look into Egyptian literary culture. Uh, so I have put the sentence in in full, even though not all of it is part of that perspective relative. Acha en du en e redu e, which is I stretched my legs er rek in order to find out dit e m er e, and this is where we are getting our uh, our relative form again. Uh, now here, first of all, for, with dit, you'll note there's no like immediate antecedent um, because there's not a noun before it, but dit has taken a t ending, uh, which is only allowable in a couple of verbal forms, and it's almost certainly not an infinitive because we just had an infinitive in rec. Uh, in an in infinitive of purpose, and it would be very odd to have like an infinitive construct chain like this. Uh, actually, no, I just I caught myself doing something, and I'm going to leave this in because I think it's rather interesting to remember. Infinitives are nouns, uh, so we do actually have a perfectly good antecedent, which is the infinitive rech. Um, and then my my point still stands that only a couple of things are allowed to have the sort of the t ending and be verbs uh, and a relative is one of them that kind of tips you off um, this is of course accepting like when t is the suffix pronoun but that's the third person feminine singular and there's nothing feminine singular here to be the suffix um, and then secondly also tipping us off there is a subject there's a subject following a verb following a noun uh, with no markers or anything in there. Uh, and therefore, we can pretty confidently take it as a relative. And indeed, if we take it as a relative, it makes good logical sense. Because what is he going to find out? What he can put in his mouth. Uh, which, in the context of the story, uh, he has just been at sea for a while, having been shipwrecked, and he lands on this island, and he wakes up, and he now wants to go see if he can find something to eat, because, you know, he just had a very long journey. He's hungry. Perfectly reasonable statement, uh, confirming that our interpretation works. And then finally, we have our sejmu and f. And as usual, the sejmu part, or the, the u in the sejmu is not going to be written. Um, this is another another full example. Mek nen en het er jeru hetmu en e ma nen en wabu her set her ek. So mek, we know mek. That is a particle. It's used for emphasis. Uh, so you know, look or behold or something like that. Um, just to emphasize what is coming. Uh, nen ni, sometimes erroneously written nen, uh, means these. Uh, and so nen ni chet, these things, 
uh, er jero is kind of an expression. It means to their limit. So how we take would say is all of these things, you know, down to the very boundary of the things. Uh, and we'll see how he further qualifies those things in a sec. Uh, and then we get a, a the word chetem, and chetem could be a noun meaning to seal, uh, but it's also a verb, uh, also meaning to seal or to put under contract or something like that. Uh, sorry, as a noun, it just means like a seal, like a, a stamp. Um, and then we get ne, and that ne is very interesting because to me, right? Uh, as a dative, or it could mark a verbal form, a sedum nf. Chetem is a strong verb. We wouldn't really get to see that. But now we look at it, and we see there's a noun phrase, all of these things. And again, the fact that the noun is a little ways away doesn't really negatively impact our interpretation uh, of the fact that we have uh, a noun phrase that immediately precedes it, because grammatically we can treat the whole noun phrase, including the preposition, modifying it as one noun, uh, followed by a verb, or at least potentially a verb, uh, and then ne, and we know that there is a relative form that takes an n like that, and we know uh, that in that case we would have a first person subject and we would have uh, a verb mo that is ultimately modifying things. And things isn't very specific. It would not be surprising to have a bunch of modifiers on these things. Because you, you, know, you need to specify something further. Um, and in particular, look at the context. Let's take the rest of the sentence. Just ignore that for a bit. Am a nen mi wabu with these wab priests, her set her ek. I have put under, or are under your care. All right. So if we take hetem as a verb and we look it up, what we'll get is that it is to put under contract. And putting it in the context of the rest of the sentence, you're, if you're putting something in the care of priests or in the care of a particular individual, uh, it would make sense that it's going to be within the terms of a contract. So semantically, it's going to make good sense, and we see that grammatically it slots in, and so we can take it as a relative, and then we get the full sentence. Look, all of these things that, there's our relative pronoun, I have put under contact, because that N indicates to us very firmly that we're dealing with a past tense, with these Wab priests are under your supervision. Now, I want to clarify something for a moment. If we go back a couple of slides, we will see that we here in the perfect relative verb, we also have an NE. The reason that we did not take that as a past tense as a sejmu nf form of the relative is that it does not work logically and that when you have a pronoun as your indirect object, as ne, it can in fact move in front of the subject. That is perfectly permissible and sometimes rather frustrating, um, but that is allowed to happen. Uh, in another circumstance, in different context, or with a different word rather than, you know, nebi, where the Lord is more likely speaking to you, if you were asking questions about it, rather, you would not ask, what did I say to my Lord, but rather, what did my Lord say to me? The situation could easily be different. Um, this is why context is always important in translating Egyptian texts. I just wanted to make sure that we pointed that out. So that is everything that we have to say on relatives. Um, that is not the last thing that you should think about to them, though. You should absolutely go through, do more exercises. Um, I didn't want to bog the video down by just having tons and tons of them, uh, but I highly recommend doing the exercises in this chapter to make sure you have a solid understanding of the relative. Uh, there are some other points 
that we need to go over in chapters 11 through 13, and that will take up the next couple of videos. Um, and then that will also kind of lead into the next really big video, which is a full overview of negations. Uh, but thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again.